Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the church were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in the numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Messiah, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Messiah, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Can you say amen? Amen. Please have a seat. And now we'll have Pastor David Moon please come up and preach to us the message title, How to Obey in Confusing Times. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hello. It's good to see you. Are you glad to see each other? Glad to see me? Yes, yes. Not yet? Okay. <laughs> um, we are starting a new series now uh, in November. All five pastors who speak English are rotating to talk about something that we've been praying for you a lot. And we're thinking about uh, what the topics should be even as we speak right now. Uh, but we have five topics that we want to talk about. And the title of the whole series is called Five Things to Learn Before COVID Finishes. Five Things to Learn Before COVID is Over. So as we uh, talk about this, we really want to be coaching you and helping you practically as to how to finish 2020 well. So with that said, today's sermon, the first topic that we want to talk about is how to obey in confusing times. How to obey in confusing times. Uh, why is obedience so important? I want you to have that question in mind. I want you to kind of ponder over it, and I'll pray for us right now. So think about why obedience is important, and I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray for your presence to be heavily in this room, that as we talk about obedience, uh, that our hearts would be kindled to listen to you and fond of obedience, that not, not only were, would there be a mental persuasion that obedience is the way to go, but there, there would be a change in our heart's allegiance to you, that we would desire to be obedient that we would love the obedience that Jesus demonstrated upon the cross and apply that to our lives. Father, today's sermon has many practical implications, some which are repentance, some which is direct obedience, some which is discerning your call right now. And the applications are so diversified that the only thing I can do is rely upon you. Father, through the Holy Spirit, would you please administer to each and every single person here, your desire for them, that they would know how to practically respond to this sermon so that it would not go to waste throughout Monday through Friday, so that we would know who to obey, how to obey, and what to expect when we obey. Father, we love you. We align ourselves to your heart's desires, and we will listen in faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why is obedience so important? Um, I have been to maybe uh, 10 different Costco's in 10 different cities. Uh, so Seoul, went there. Toronto, uh, San Jose, uh, probably won't reach 10, I'm forgetting right now. Uh, Toronto, Toronto, and then Kingston, and then uh, Austin, Texas, and also here in Virginia. And as I go to the same place, you know, it seems like the same place, but it's in different cities. As I go there, it's so remarkable that no matter where I go, I know where to find the roast chicken and the soy milk, uh, two things I always look for. 
And the reason for that is every single branch, no matter where it is globally, is because they have a training manual, a, a quality control, and all the managers, all the employees, all the directors know to follow according to the guidelines and the principles of the Costco philosophy. And so, in a way, we can see that the kingdom of Costco, the kingdom of Costco's president, uh, Craig Jelinek, right, is being expanded by the obedience of its employees. That's the same thing here. So far, uh, we know that God's kingdom is expanded by the church, the followers of Christ, when they obey his word. It's the same principle. And no matter what we've seen throughout 2020, all the social distancing and the pandemic going on, we still see that key prerogatives are followed in corporations. How much more so in the church? The pandemic is not a hiatus period for us to stop obeying God. The mission is still the same. We are still called to evangelize the nations and to obey Jesus in every calling. Amen? We're still called to do that. We are not on break. We still must make disciples, and the bride of Christ must become more beautiful and flawless every single day. And for that, we are called to obey. All of this is done when we obey. The mission of the church is carried out when we obey. So in today's passage, we want to look at what obedience looks like on the ground, what it accomplishes, and finally, how to obey. We have five points today. Uh, I promise not to uh, make it too long. But every single point has definite applications in your life. So please listen along. Verses 1 and 2. The first point is this. What you get, get from first, verses 1 and 2, the first point, if you obey in the midst of great hardship, God provides. If you obey in the midst of great hardship, God provides. Verses 1 and 2. Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. So where is this hardship that we see here? Uh, scripture says that Paul came to Derby and Lystra, um, and Paul didn't just happen to stop by there. It was not a mistake that he ended up in Derby and Lystra. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 14, two chapters before, Paul was actually stoned and left for dead in Derby and Lystra. So he was stoned here. He was left for dead. He was almost killed, and he survived and went on, and he came back here today. And this by itself is something to think about. It is human nature to avoid trauma. It's human nature to avoid past failures or pain or something that disturbs us, right? And Paul is doing the exact opposite. I remember when I was age six, and I was walking by uh, a... a, a uh, mobile home park in Austin, Texas. And I, I remember being stung by a hornet, um, and it was around the pinky. And so I got so mad and so angry that I took a stick, and uh, I didn't know how nature worked back then. <laughs> so when I took a stick, and I went to the beehive, and I beat it, right? And I got stung about three more times. Lips, face, uh, somewhere else. Um, and as I was being stung, uh, I, I, I just... I, I had engraved within me the pain of being stung by a bee. And so now, if you see a bee somewhere in our church, you can expect to find me on the opposite side of the church. Uh, that's how traumatized I am about this experience. And it's just basic human psychology, basic human nature to avoid pain and suffering. But it says here, Paul came to Derby and Lystra. He came back to where he was stoned. And so you know that he's not just coming here because he wanted to or because he happened to be there. This was an act of obedience in communion with the Holy Spirit. God is sending him there. And so he followed. Now, we don't know exactly what God is planning in Derby and Lystra. And there doesn't seem like there is an explicit strategy or a goal that, he is, that, that is being accomplished as Paul goes here. But here's the thing. Now, he meets Timothy who later becomes Paul's spiritual son, his son in the faith, and an irreplaceable partner in Christ who carries out Paul's gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and his God, Paul's ministry. And so what do we see here? Even in the midst of great hardship, if you obey, and this is not a formula, I'm not saying that it works every single time, but if you obey, especially when you're going against your flesh, God provides something for you that you never expected. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, 
Has God ever brought you to a place where you have failed before, miserably? Is God ever telling you to go back to a place where you suffered and you dare not go back to? You're so afraid of it. Is God telling you to go back to a place of trauma and obey him there? A pain that you have not addressed in your heart. I'm here to tell you that obedience to God's sovereignty can and will involve a great personal cost. Just read Bonhoeffer's uh, Cost of Discipleship. I want to tell you today, don't avoid that pain. Don't avoid your previous failures. God's purpose is to sanctify you. And he will make you come across the same issue that you've been bothered about until you see what victory in Christ is like. And for that, he will provide. He will provide. Whether it's a spiritual son like Timothy, whether it's healing in your inner heart, whether it's overcoming that trauma, God will provide what he deems necessary when you obey in hardship. Amen? Obey in hardship. Obey especially when it is hard. Spurgeon said this, faith laughs at what fear weeps over. Faith laughs at what fear weeps over. What causes you to weep over when you see it in faith and obey God, there will be a day of laughter. Amen? There will be. And I want you to imagine what God is telling you right now. What he's showing you in your heart. What are you so afraid of? What are you running away from that has caused you to not obey until you've heard these words right now? May there be obedience, even at great personal cost. Amen. Point two, verse three. If you obey God's call to proclaim the gospel, he gives you wisdom. This is point two. If you obey God's call to proclaim the gospel, he gives you wisdom. Verse 3 says, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father, Timothy's father, was a Greek. Uh, what is this all about? Paul circumcised Timothy. And that by itself is kind of strange, right? Because it says, because of the Jews who were in that place. So Paul circumcised Timothy. And this is really interesting because in Galatians 2, 3, Paul explicitly uh, refuses to circumcise Titus, another son in the faith, another disciple. And the reason is, is because Titus wasn't supposed to be circumcised because he would be reaching out to the Gentiles. But for the Jews, Paul is saying, okay, it's good for you to be circumcised. So Titus is not circumcised. Timothy is circumcised. Now the question is, is he being inconsistent? No. Because he knows the principles that are at stake. Right? This was an ambassador to the Gentiles. Right? So Titus is an ambassador to the Gentiles. That's why Paul is dead set on not having him circumcised so that the Gentiles would not believe that circumcision is your way to faith and, and, and salvation. And so for the Gentiles... Circumcision was a stumbling block. But for the, for the Jews who had opinions about Greeks and for their heathenism, Paul says, okay, Timothy, you should get circumcised because I don't want the Jews to talk about this instead of the gospel. So here's the thing. Timothy, we're not talking about Paul's obedience right now. We're talking about Timothy, who was probably 35 years old at this time. So a 35-year-old man who knows that he is free not to get circumcised according to the gospel because it has nothing to do with salvation. Yet for the sake of the Jews hearing the gospel, he chose to be circumcised. There's a period where anesthetics were not too highly developed, right? It wasn't perfect. And so Timothy is undergoing great personal pain, 35 years old, right? And he undergoes that for the purpose of spreading the gospel without obstacles, why is this so important? That's wisdom given by the Holy Spirit. So it looks like inconsistency from a human standpoint, but from God's perspective, if you prioritize the gospel first, you can weave in and out of different cultures. And why is that so relevant today? In a culture where everything is about protecting my rights and my preferences, the first question that we ask is, do I have to? Do I have to get circumcised? Do I have to do this to proclaim the gospel? And according to what is comfortable, you stop right there. That's your boundary, right? But what it's saying here is that Timothy gave up his rights by obedience, his Greek culture, his physical autonomy, 
his rights. He gave that all up just so that the Jewish diaspora would have one less obstacle to the gospel. KCPC, America is groaning for Tuesday's results. Left and right has never been more tensely opposed to each other. But we should not be tense. Amen? Because we see that when we see into heaven, according to Isaiah's vision, God is still upon his throne. He still reigns. Therefore, the mission has not changed. Our, our role to proclaim the gospel has not changed. And so here's the thing. You need to observe in this broken, fragmented world that there are people on the left to save. There are people on the right to save. And if spreading the gospel is not your priority, you will be focused on the political positions instead of delivering the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has the only power to save. Do you get this? And so when proclaiming the gospel is your key goal, you can weave in and out of leftist circles and rightist circles and conservatives and liberals because the gospel makes you give up your priorities. It makes you give up your rights and privileges so that anyone on the left and anyone on the right could know who Jesus is. Our church will not change. Our mission will not change. Two days from now, we still are called to faithful obedience to spread the gospel. May you obey Jesus, weaving in and out of every culture in the world. And when the gospel is your priority, God will give you wisdom and insight. Amen? Does anyone need wisdom right now? Does anyone need wisdom to talk to their friends? Does anyone need wisdom how to talk to their children? Prioritize the gospel. Obey that. And he'll teach you how to communicate in this broken world. Number three, point three. If you obey in the little things, God uses it to do great things. If you obey in the little things, God uses it to do great things. Amen? Verse four, four through five. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance, the, the churches, right? Uh, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So here's the thing. The, the next verse records that Paul's team was delivering decisions. Okay, so Paul was out here not because he was trying to just evangelize without a, a specific agenda. The agenda was this, to go to every church and to deliver a letter which communicated a decision reached in Jerusalem. Okay, so what was this decision? It's a very dry, boring decision. Number one, you don't need to get circumcised to be saved. And you could just imagine Timothy's expression. <laughs> Why did I just go through this, right? <laughs> but it's saying, you don't need to get saved, uh, circumcised to get saved. Number two, just abstain from food sacrificed to idols and abstain from blood and also uh, stay away from sexual immorality. Bye-bye. That's the letter. And so Paul is delivering uh, these very dry decisions and he's just communicating that, right? And so this is the thing. When you look at Paul, his fluent writings, his systematic knowledge, his charisma, his faithful zeal. If you look at that, he could have probably delivered on the spot a much more persuasive, powerful uh, oral argument. He really could have. And he could have strengthened the church by doing his own revival conferences. It was not outside of his abilities. But here's the thing. He was acting like a delivery boy, going across all these churches, sustaining and, and, and suppressing what he's capable of, his common sense, his abilities, and he's delivering a letter. And that's what it says. It says right afterwards, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Amen? In the small obedience, when God is calling you to do things that seem so trivial, just pass out this letter. Just stand out there in the parking lot right? Just serve as a soon leader. <laughs> Just come to the soon. Just, you know, take this Bible study class. When you obey in the small things, God does the great things. That's what the whole uh, uh, faith in action series was all about. People exercised faith and they obeyed and God did crazy things. That's the whole point of all three uh, of the past sermons. Same principle today. If you obey in the small things, God increases the church. He increases his kingdom day by day, which you cannot do.
but in your small, tangible things of obedience. I have a question for you. How long has it been since you saw the amazing work of the Holy Spirit in your life? How long? A month? A year? There was a couple who came to me, and they wanted to talk about pneumatology. They were so well-educated, but they were like, Pastor David, I haven't seen the Holy Spirit work. He doesn't do things anymore. I told him, have you ever obeyed him? Try obeying me. Uh, Just presume that obeying me right now, God is regulating and delegating his authority to me as your pastor. Go there in the corner right now and proclaim the gospel. That's a busy street market. They couldn't. When you don't obey in the small things, how can God show you that he's alive and active? And this is an area that you and I have to repent in. Obedience comes about by the small things, but we don't see God's work because we are disobedient in the small things. Or you have a uh, misunderstanding of theology that God doesn't really talk to you these days. He talks so much, that's why the Bible is so thick. He talks to you every single day. Every hour of your life, he has a will for you. Do you know that? And when you are not obeying that and you suppress that, right, in your unrighteousness and you continue not following that, then guess what? Uh, You won't see God work in your life. A lot of us are idealists. We look for great movements I want to see a beautiful house church movement that will sweep the nation. That's what I want to get involved in. I want to see and I want to follow a charismatic pastor who loves everyone, who is talented in apologetics. I'll follow him forever. But here's the thing. Have you faithfully stood out in the parking lot for a while? Have you you obeyed your pastor's practical urgings? Have you done QT? Have you prayed this day? And when we don't obey in the small things, your idealism doesn't have a foundation. Without obedience, our faith and our spiritual life is always ill and decaying from the inside. And you know what? Obedience is the white blood cell that fights against that decay and fights against that illness. It's the preservative that keeps your life alive, right? So let's say you have faith and you're walking a spiritual life every day. But if you don't have obedience, you automatically start decaying. That's the flow of the world. We're always fighting and going upstream, but the world will have you flowing downstream if you're not fighting, if you're not obeying. You will find yourself decaying. Obedience keeps you alive. Obedience keeps your eyes focused on what God can do, what what God can do today, and what he does in a practical sense in your everyday life. Obedience is the only trigger to that. I just have one request of you. There is a place that God has called you to. There is a thing that God has called you to. There is a small act of obedience that God is calling to to you right now. And my only request is this. Please be there. Be there. Just be there. Wherever God wants you to be, just be there. Your availability to obey God is more important than your ability to do God's will. Do you get that? Your availability is more important than your ability. Just be there. And God will work through your simple obedience. What small thing has God asked you to do today that you have been ignoring recently? I challenge you and I urge you, obey right now and see what God can do through your small obedience. He does great things. He will strengthen this church, amen? KCPC will grow in his faith every single day, amen? Because what? One person obeyed. Point number four. If you obey when God closes doors, you get God's presence. When you obey when God closes doors, you get God's presence. Verses six through seven. As they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Uh, Let's look at the map that I prepared for this. Uh, There's a map of this journey right here, uh, and you follow the red line. So they start 
all the way down from Antioch, and they go all the way, and when they receive the Macedonian call, they cross uh, the, the ocean there, right? But as they're going up there, look, right over, uh, right over in the final stop, right before the yellow, first yellow line, Okay, so those areas right there is Asia Minor, and they have a lot of ports, a lot of urban areas, high uh, population concentration. And so the logical argument is, hey, from there to there, if we just go there, we have control over the ports. And so the gospel can actually go across all the way to Spain and Rome, right? And so logically, it, you could go there and there would be a great impact, but Jesus says, no, don't go there. The Spirit kept them from going there. And so they're like, okay, so let's go up then, and they go up to Galatia, and at Mysia, they want to go to Bithynia because they're like, okay, God didn't want us to go west, how about east? But the Spirit of Jesus says no. And this is something that really, we really, really need to understand. Obedience to God's sovereignty recognizes when God closes a door, Right? And this is so weird. This map is so weird because, okay, they're traveling 600 kilometers across these areas and Phrygia, Galatia before reaching Troas, right? And go to Macedonia later on. And so this team is obeying God's word to not go to these areas. And so they're crossing around all these areas, not proclaiming the gospel, uh, keeping their mouths shut for about 600 kilometers. And so why is this? There's no church planting going on, no evangelism for an extended time, even though these are good things that God wants because God is sovereign. They're obeying a sovereign God who works timing in geography to his benefit. The Christian walk is not about designating a formula and principles that work and then trying to get there the best you can. You know, this generation is so used to Google Maps that what would we do? We wouldn't have any of those mistakes. We would go straight from Antioch, straight to Troas. And you would never have met Timothy. You would never have met all the other people that I'll talk about later on. And you just go straight from there to there, avoiding all pain, avoiding all confusion, and just going as you believe is the best formula. And that's why so many of us disobey. We operate on our best common sense and not the Word of God. And we miss out on so many things because of our common sense. A lot of you have formulated the best Christian walk possible for yourselves and you're intent on keeping that formula. But what if God closes the door? What if you recognize that he's saying, no, that's a beautiful thing. You want to glorify God in the next job. Awesome. You want to glorify God in this marriage. But what if God says no? Are you okay to stop by? and not know where you're going? Everyone has to know where they're going these days. If you cast a vision these days as a pastor, everyone wants to know what's step one, two, three, what's the goal, what's the impact? What if we can't tell you because we don't know where God is leading us? What if you don't know what your life is going to accomplish because God hasn't shown you tomorrow? Obedience doesn't require for you to see the full picture now or ever. Obedience doesn't require you to see the full picture, now or ever. And so we avoid the pain of Derby and Lystra, right? And so if you formulate the best life now, you, you avoid the pain of Derby and Lystra, your former traumas, and you never get your Timothys, right? You don't prioritize the gospel in intense racial and political situations because it's tough, and so you don't get wisdom, right? And if you don't obey the small things because it's not efficient and you're just looking for the most effective thing to do in your life, you don't witness God's great work and your smallness. But when you do obey, your life might look like this, round, around, around, around. And you don't understand, it's like the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, not knowing that God is sanctifying them, teaching them to appreciate God's presence instead of the promised land, but that's what your life might look like if you're actively obeying. Quoting from one of my favorite authors, Tolkien, right? He says this, all who wander are not, are not lost. All who wander are not lost. Just for effect, rub it in one more time. All who wander are not lost if you wander in obedience to Jesus. A lot of young adults 
I think I'm averaging about two to three visitations and phone calls per day now, a lot of them young adults, all of them anguished about how their life is so slow, can't find their new job, their marriage is being postponed, their previous marriage, their, their current marriage is stagnant, and they don't know what God's doing. But here's the thing, God is not worried about efficiency. He's not worried too much about what you do or what, what your next job is. He's worried about what your heart is doing in faith and obedience and whether you have more fellowship and intimacy with him. Many of us stumble through this life like we're blind. We fumble and, and we go through rejection after rejection. We go through financial hardships and we don't know why we're going through all of this and it only makes sense when the Spirit is leading you through that. Can you see God's mercy in this? Can you see God's sovereignty in leading you to closed door after closed door, zigzag, circle and circle, until you look more like Jesus? Can you see the mercy in that? That you wouldn't be obsessed with your own accomplishments, but you would see the work of God in you through all of that process. That is the peace that the Christian enjoys. That no matter the hardship, no matter the blockage or the obstacle, that God's doing a wonderful thing in your life. God wants to walk with you. That's the point. He wants to walk with you day by day. Because God is not a GPS. Efficiency is not a standard. He desires to have fellowship with the ones that he loves. This is theoretical to a lot of people right now, but it's very practical, especially to parents. Like dads, like you go on hiking trips with your children. Why go with your children, right? Because if the goal is to reach the top of the summit or the top of the hill, and efficiency is your sole purpose, your children slow you down, right? They look at the flowers, they're distracted by the streams, they pick up stones and throw it somewhere, and you're like, we need to get to the top. But no. For the father, it's all about the journey because they are with the people that they love. Like how hard is it uh, to understand that from a human sense? All of you know this. And yet, when God takes his time going through this, the streams and the valleys of your life, and it seems so slow, can you not see that God is enjoying you? He's enjoying touching your heart so that you know who he is? It's a story of that, uh, that uh, child who, uh, I think this was Max Lucado's uh, sermon illustration. And there was this child who uh, got locked into a, a bathroom because they, they were going, undergoing renovation. And so as the child is kept in the bathroom, uh, he says, Dad, Dad, I can't get out. The, Lord's lo uh, the door is locked. And so Dad says, it's okay. And he comes through the window and he goes into the bathroom. And he says, now we're stuck together, right? And so the child, um, he previously wanted to go out and play with his friends. He wanted to play games. He wanted to just escape the smelliness and darkness of that small bathroom. But then he started talking with his father. Uh, he had a conversation. He never knew that his father had so many different weird sides to him. Uh, he never knew that his father was so intimate and intricate in his understanding of his son. And as they had a fun conversation, before they knew it, the repairman had opened the door. And the dad's like, okay, you're free to go now. And the child, after experiencing the father, says, I would rather stay in this small, dark, and smelly place with you than go out to my friends. I want to ask you, do you want to stay in the painful, confusing, small place that you're in right now just because the father's there? Would you forsake all of your future glory just to know who Jesus is right now, the darkness is the best place to find him. In suffering, God speaks to you. So don't avoid it. Know that God wants you. When he closes the door, it's fellowship time. Amen? When he closes the door, it is fellowship time. And he wants to know you. Many of you ask for solutions, but God wants you. Amen? Amen? Can you just think about that for a while? God wants you right now. He doesn't want you to get your job. He doesn't want you to escape the financial pain that you're in right now. He doesn't want you to escape your confusion. 
He wants you. Stop refusing him. Point number five. Obey now and God will prepare you for the future. Verses 9 through 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And even these two verses are so rich in detail, I actually had to cut my sermon uh, by about 25%, just not talking about this part. But here's the important thing. One day, God will tell you where to go. What must we do then? In verse 10 it says, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he went. And so here's this. His passion was not running out by going from closed door to closed door. As soon as he found out what God's will was, immediately he went. They weren't really clear why they were going, but they obeyed. And so obedience right now, just going because of a dream, because some person in Macedonia seemed to be calling them, they, they observed that and they just went not knowing what that fully meant. But they concluded together, right? There was conversation with them. And here's something that really, uh, that's really awesome that happens. Until verse 10, the narrative is all written in third person. Paul did this, Silas did this, and them. They use, it uses all this third person language. But suddenly in verse 10, it starts saying, we. And so the, uh, the perspective changes. And so it means another person was added onto Paul's ministry. What happened? Luke, who wrote Luke Acts, Join the team now. And that's what's so awesome. Paul wasn't really preparing for the future. Like he was just obeying the call immediately right now. But what God is doing is he's attaching Luke, the physician, to record all of Paul's works so that a future legacy would remain of all the actions of the book of Acts. You get that? So Paul obeyed right now, but God had attached to him someone who would faithfully record all of the works of the gospel so that we now have a text to preach on. Luke is the author of both Luke and Acts. Without him, everything that Paul did in Acts, we wouldn't know about. We wouldn't know about his first or second or third journey. Or we would have broken, fragmented accounts of it. And so by Luke's faithful accounting of all of this, Paul's legacy of what he did, his obedience, his faith, is actually shown in his life later on through us and in us now. Here's the thing. Obey now. Obey immediately God will take care of your future. Amen? Obey now, and God will prepare you for the future. He really will. It's not for you to know what the future holds. This sounds like a corny, like a Hallmark card, but it's the best way to remember things. Don't be worried about the future, but trust in the person who holds your future. Don't be worried about the future, but trust in the person who holds your future securely. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. Obey now. You don't have to make sure that it works. Obey God now. Amen? God is calling you to do something today or tomorrow, or he's been working on a short-term project in your heart. Obey now and get the thing done. God will do and take care of the impact of it. Does anyone need God's help? Do you need wisdom? Do you need God's work and providence in your life? Do you need God's presence in your life? Do you need his guidance for the future? All this happens when you obey God. Amen? And Acts 16, 1 through 10 is merely a rapid series of snapshots that show you what's possible. It's not a complete list. It's meant to be continued in your life. But here's the last thing. I'm sorry, it's 11, 10 right now, I think. Um, but I need to talk about this. One final question we have to ask. How do we listen to God? How do we listen to God? This is the most frequent question I've been asked. I've been asked this question at least five times since I got here in the, in the span of five months. How do we listen to God? How do we know his will? You really do want to listen to his will for your life. You really do want to obey. I know that you have good hearts. You want to obey God, and you want to obey immediately. You want to recognize the fruit of obedience. And Jesus doesn't only say that obeying God is possible and listening to him is possible. He says it's a necessity. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So you hear Jesus' voice. But once again, how? How do you listen to God? How do you know what his will for you is? Romans 12, 12 2, that Pastor John preached, out, preached on, 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Once again, it's a transformation of the, of the mind that comes from being exposed to the word of God and the will of God on a daily basis. QT transforms bits and bits of you until your whole mind knows what the will of God is, right? Only a mind that has been cultivated and transformed by the word and the spirit can hear the voice of God and discern it and obey it. Do you get this? Heath Ledger was such a good actor. Why? If you read, after, after he died, um, people read his diaries about how he prepared for acting in Batman. And it said this, he meditated upon the mind of the Joker. That's what he said. And so he wasn't following a script or a formula. He went in front of the camera and he just became Joker. And the same thing for us. We who are exposed to Scripture are not bound just by all of the proactive commands or the list of things to do. It's not a grocery list. We become the embodiment of Jesus Christ himself with the Holy Spirit living on us, and we live out the identity through a transformed mind. That's how you obey. That's how you listen to the will of God. So let me say this. The thoughts of a regenerated mind and the affections of a regenerated heart, this is probably the most common but the most overlooked ways of listening to the voice of Jesus. Do you get that? The regenerated mind and the affections of a regenerated heart is how you listen to Jesus and obey him. So finally, the question is this. Okay, I want the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? Philippians 2, 5, 8. Have this mind among yourselves so that you can be transformed and obey now, which is yours in Christ Jesus Verse 6, verse 7 is all popular. We all know it. And verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Jesus' mind was a mind of obedience. And if you have that mind, if you're transformed by that mind, you will be obedient. This is the mind of our Savior. What and a beautiful Savior we have. Obedience unto death so that children of rebellion like us could become children of obedience. If you have this mind of Jesus in your mind and heart, you can obey in confusing times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help your people obey and listen to you. Please don't let them make the mistake of just trying to decipher your will by a secret code or just by trying this or trying that, but in a continual relationship with you, with their mind being transformed by the Holy Spirit through your word, help them know what to obey. Help them obey quickly, trusting in you, enjoying presence with you when you close the doors so that this church would expand the kingdom of God. In this confusing time, Father, we don't know what to do but the one thing that we always have had in ancient, ancient times and the one thing that we will continue to have right now is your presence and your word speaking to us. We know what the mission is. We know what your heart is. Lord, would you transform us into people who obey? Holy Spirit, please draw out things that have escaped your people's attention for a while and help them obey what you are calling out of them right now. Let them reflect. Let their action be swift and let their obedience please you and expand your kingdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise from our seats as we close our time in worship. Let's declare this together that Christ, he is sufficient for us, he is enough for us, and that we can follow him and that we can decide every day to follow him, to love him, and to obey him. Let's sing this together. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion 